Okay, so as we're waiting for people to get in, I think let's let's get started. For those of you with us already, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Burns Acre webinar on provisional tax. Very very exciting topic. I'm sure you'll agree, but uh, definitely relevant, especially this time of year with our provisional tax deadlines looming at the end of this month. And also everything that's just been happening during the year, lots of, lots of financial uncertainty, lots of turmoil, uh, lots of questions, lots of uncertainty from people around how to handle provisional tax, um, what, what uh, sort of relief is available to them. You know, our government's been great in telling us we've got all this relief available. How does it all fit into the mix? So our aim here today is to really debunk the provisional tax process. Um, and also just provide a broad-based information session around provisional tax and how you should be formulating your strategic approach um, to provisional tax. Certainly, if you're, if you're um, fortunate enough to be a Burns Acre client, you would have already have heard from our offices we're well underway with our, with our prof tax process. Um, and I think this, um, there's definitely a need for, for this information session and this webinar just to give everybody um, bit more information, a bit more peace of mind, a bit more comfort and direction around the process, how they should be approaching it, and what we as a firm are doing to support our clients during, during this process and during this time. So um, I think before we, before we get started and before I introduce our guest speaker, um, I see we have a lot of people that may not know who we are. Um, thank you very much for taking the time, even our clients, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we know you're all busy running businesses, you know, busy lives, keeping the wheels of the economy turning. And we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to spend, spend some time with us and, and join us on this webinar. Um, for, for those of you who don't, don't know Burns Akert um, and haven't dealt with us before, just a quick uh, overview of who we are, what we do. So Burns Akert's a firm of chartered accountants. We're also registered accountants and auditors with Erba. Our services include a full service suite of finance accounting and tax services. So monthly accounting, annual accounting, financial statements, tax, VAT, PAYE support, essentially a whole service support suite to, to businesses. And I, I think what, what separates us and differentiates us from the other players in the market is that you can actually customize your service suite to your business. So if you need support in a key area, be it payroll, be it VAT, be it um, tax planning, uh, we can actually customize our, customize our service around your needs. Um, and we also, we also offer a different element where we, we provide strategic financial decision-making and support services to our clients. And, and we do this through, through various mechanisms, either through the partners in our business, um, through Brad, through Eric, and through our executive, and also through our our senior and finance managers within the business. So, so that's basically our, who we are, Burns Akert in, in a nutshell. Um, the firm is headed up by Bradley Woolridge, who is also our managing director, and we're fortunate enough to have him as our, as our guest speaker today. Um, he, heads up, he heads up the business. Um, Eric McDonald, who you'll also see in the, in the list of, of people here today, is our risk and compliance partner. So he takes care of all the risk and compliance in the firm. And um, myself as the GM of Burns Aiket now also head up our Johannesburg office and, and division. So, so that's just quickly introduction as to who we are and, and what we do and what, what services we offer. And um, so I think, you know, to, to not keep you guys um, too long, let's, let's jump straight into it and let's, let's do a quick um, introduction into, into some ground rules. Um, so if you just bear with me, I think, as I said before, our, our goal is to provide you guys with a broad-based information session around ProvTax and, how, and the thinking that's around ProvTax, what your obligations are as a taxpayer, and how you should be approaching and formulating your, your approach to provisional tax, which, is, which, which we feel is very important. Um, you, everybody's been placed on mute um, for, for obvious reasons, and please feel free to raise questions via the Zoom chat. So we've got, um, we've got our tax team, we've got our, our senior staff members on standby, who will be assisting with respond, responding to any questions that you may raise in the Zoom chat. 
and we will really do our best to try and get back to you and answer any questions you may have during the session. Um, unfortunately, with a volume of questions, we may not get to everybody, but what we certainly do is after this session, the presentation will be made available to everybody via email, and we will take the most relevant and the most common questions that we may not have addressed during the, during the Q&A session after this, and actually include it in the Q&A section of our presentation. So everybody will have sighted those queries, um, and um, you will see our, our firm's view and our responses to those queries. So I think let's, um, before I introduce Brad, let's just see what we will be covering today. We'll be covering the basics around ProfTax. So, and I think it's important that everybody, we go back to basics and we understand the concept of provisional tax, what it is, what qualifies people as provisional taxpayers, how we estimate provisional tax payments and how we go about the process, um, when it must be paid and what the implications are if, if we don't comply as a taxpayer with provisional taxes. Um, we'll then get into the piece which I'm sure everybody's excited about and probably the main reason why you're here is to find out what government concessions there are um, in terms of the COVID-19 tax relief. Our government have been fantastic in making this relief available to us. Unfortunately, nobody understands it. And part of this process is to make sure that we kind of debunk that and simplify it and, um, and provide you guys with, with the information, equip you with the information to, to see what relief is available, how you can access it, and more importantly, what the implications of accepting those relief measures are. Um, we'll also then touch on the Burns Acre processes, so give you a bit of a behind the scenes view around our thinking, uh, how we go about supporting our clients in um, approaching provisional tax, how we go about assisting them in formulating optimal provisional tax strategies, um, how we go around the planning, how we control the process, and ultimately getting to the point where we can um, finalize the provisional tax process and make sure that everybody stays compliant and fulfills their obligations to SARS. And then lastly, we're also going to touch on a few, on a few business categories, certainly from, from our perspective, which is intrinsically linked to the approach that, that we take and the strategy that we take with regards to provisional tax. So based on where you or your business fall within this business category or business matrix would then determine or guide you as to what strategy, certainly from our point, we suggest you follow in terms of provisional tax um, to make sure that it, is, it provides the best solution for you. So I think um, without, without delaying any further, I'm going to hand you over to Bradley Woolridge. Um, as I said before, he's our managing director. Um, He's a highly qualified and very highly experienced chartered accountant. Um, but more than that, he's also an entrepreneur in his own right. So he's definitely the right person to be having this discussion with you guys. He, he understands the complexities around provisional tax, the importance around having the right strategic approach around your tax planning and your provisional tax planning and the implications that it can have and will have on your business going forward. So, I think without delaying any further, Bradley, I'll open the floor to you and uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Al. Morning, everyone. Uh, I hope that you get a little bit of value from today. Um, I just wanted to start off with a little bit of humor. So what I normally do is when people ask me what I do, Alan gave it and made it sound very good, but I normally just tell people that I'm a bookkeeper and then they think that, you know, that's what I do. And this young man in, in the picture, he obviously told this girl that he's a bean counter. And of course, by the time she gets to the house, she, 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 she realizes she's got herself a bean counter instead of an actual accountant. So I hope that I do more than, 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 than carry myself as a bookkeeper today and that you guys really leave today's session with a really clear view of, of, of how this pertains to you. That, that's sort of my number one thing. Um, as we move forward, try and understand what provisional tax is. It's really not complicated. And, and, and I want to touch on that so that we all sort of get it and, and provisional tax is essentially if you make any money if you have any income whatsoever the government are going to tax it and the bulk of everyone's income is is tends to be their salary and we tend to pay PAYE on our salary so the government are getting their money all the time but provisional tax arises because they're not getting all the money so specifically companies don't pay provisional tax 
And individuals who earn other income, whether that's private income, interest income, capital gains, rental income, the government's not able to access their piece of the pie. So twice a year, the government makes us estimate our income and then charges us our tax uh, so that they can continue to, to fill their coffers. And that's really what provisional tax is. So I think that that's very important to understand. Do you have income that's not taxed on a monthly basis? And if the answer is yes, you're probably a provisional taxpayer. That's a nice simplistic way to start the year. And that good reminder for everyone is that financial years are how the tax man works. And there's really two types of financial years. There's what I call the personal tax year, which runs from March to February. And then there's the company tax year, which runs from a company year in until 12 months later. So most companies tend to also run March to February, but certainly, you know, there's quite a lot of exceptions. Um, right, let's keep moving. So when we talk about who you are as a provisional taxpayer, I've alluded to it. You get income. And as long as that income takes you over a tax threshold, you're a provisional taxpayer. So every, in every company, every legal entity, doesn't matter. You, you know, the, the questions we always get are things like, but my company is dormant. Well, dormancy is still alive and dormancy requires a registration. Or things like it's an asset holding company. Well, it might be an asset holding company, but it's still a provisional taxpayer. So tax is, a, is another language in itself. But essentially, even if you owe the tax man nothing, you're still a taxpayer. So you still have to submit that you owe him nothing. And you'll see later on as we go through this why, why that's important. So I think keep an eye on that uh, from that perspective. Then understanding how it's calculated is, uh, is, uh, is very important because the first period um, is where we are now. And of course, we're only, we're only five months into, into the year and now we're calculating 12 months worth of, uh, worth, worth of taxable income. So this is why first provisional is actually the easiest. And, and I'll explain to you why it's easy. And then as you understand that, maybe the, the, any stress you have around this will, 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 will be lessened. Second provisional tax is essentially when you pay your taxes for the year, you do your assessment. And, 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 and what I think people often get confused by is your tax assessment. So if you, think of, if you think of the difference between an estimate and an actual, an estimate is a view and an actual is a position. So when you get assessed for tax, that's an actual assessment. You're telling the tax man, this is what I made, here's my documents, and that's my number. And the provisionals happen before that, which is the estimates. The irony with the tax man, and one of the reasons why we take it so seriously at Burns Acres, is that the second your estimates are out, the tax man uses this as an opportunity to audit you in detail. So now you've got the headache of having to prove everything that's happened, make sure you haven't missed any simple elements of the equation, but also, um, you know, you have to go through the pain and the cost of dealing with SARS. And currently that, that can be, you know, we don't want to put a number to it, but SARS can drag things out for a really long time. So you don't want that hanging over your head. So I think that that's, that's quite important. Then the third provisional tax, I don't like to talk about too much because people think of it as, as an actual payment, but really it's not. And, and what it means, the third provisional, is that if you estimate incorrectly and you realize that, you use the third provisional payment to top up that estimate. But essentially, if you were going to realize it, you may as well get assessed because of the time period. So we don't, we don't use a lot of third, uh, third, third, third provisionals or top ups, but really the, if, if we found a client where the estimate was just totally disproportionate, you know, they had a big deal or they had a large income that they didn't see coming and it happened in February, for example, we would then, we would then go into the third, the third provisional space. So I hope that gives you a little bit of context around you know, the, the elements. Um, in order for us to estimate taxable income, and this is specifically for first provisional tax, we start with the basic amount. So your basic amount is really what you've paid tax on before. So SARS, we would have all heard Tito talking recently about zero-based budgeting. And so how SARS work is and on your taxes is they just assume last year's tax is the minimum that you're going to pay. That's really what they do. And that's what the basic amount is. The basic amount is the last year assessed tax position. And if the last year assessed is more than 18 months, then they start to increase that assessment by 8%. And what I wanted you to hear a little bit of today, especially the corporate guys, is that the second you reduce your basic amount, SARS take control. And that's never a position we want to be in. 
and it's highly relevant now because of COVID. And what that means is that SARS take control because you have your estimate. If SARS don't accept your estimate, they will ask you for reasons and they'll ask you for supporting information. If they don't accept that, they will just give you an estimate that you'll have to pay on. But really the issue is online on the third section there in the last sentence, you'll see here, this increase is not subject to objection and appeal. So SARS can give you a document that says you owe them a million rand. They can be totally wrong. They haven't bought your, your explanation that COVID's crippled your business and you don't have the, op the, the opportunity to object and appeal. So now you have a SARS debt, whether you pay it or not is a separate issue. But while you have the debt, you can't get your tax clearance, you flagged on their system, and you're in a very, really bad space. So, so we're extremely cautious about reducing base amounts for this exact reason. And we can, we can go into that more a little bit later. And importantly, just remember that your base amount will always exclude capital gains, uh, any benefits like retirement or retrenchment and things like that. It's essentially the base amount of what you earned in the prior assessed period. Uh, we speak simply, but it really is a simple number. If you earned 100 Rand last year and you were taxed on 100, so I'll start this year with 100 as your base amount. That's, that's the long and the short of, of the base amount. But I hope I've at least touched on the importance of the base amount and, and why we, we use that as our firm guide. So from a company perspective, I've already touched on the fact that if it's a nil, you still have to submit. It's the same for individuals, but individuals shouldn't have nils because you've got to ask yourself as an individual, if you've got a nil prop tax return, why are you a provisional taxpayer? You're not earning any income. So I think that's just something to bear in mind. We do get that quite a lot. A lot of people ask us, why am I a provisional taxpayer? An example of one of the elements that used to exist was that all directors were provisional taxpayers. Now, that, that rule's changed because, you know, because you're a director, you might just be PAYE uh, paid uh, as a salary and there's really no reason to be provisional. So that no longer applies. So just bear in mind, you're a provisional taxpayer if you earn money that isn't taxed when you earn it. That's the simplistic way of getting this right and knowing if you qualify or not. So here's the thing, this is, what, this is another area of the business that I'm very glad that we can speak publicly now and, and touch more people at once because a lot of people say to us, well, just don't submit a, a tax return. So the, the first point is that if you don't submit one, they'll estimate potentially and you can't object. So you're shooting yourself in the foot. The second point is that if you don't submit your provisional tax return, you will not be in a position to get a tax clearance. So why on earth would you do that over something? And these are often the null returns that we, that, we, that we talk about. So why would you want to compromise your overall standing with SARS as a taxpayer, get yourself linked because you don't want to submit a null tax return. It's nonsensical, but it's born of a lack of understanding of the bigger picture and the process that you as a taxpayer or that your company as a taxpayer is undergoing when linked to SARS. So I just really want you to bear that in mind that failure to submit is, is not a good idea. We don't allow it in our firm. So that's really, I suppose, the point. So when must you pay? So it's also, it's also quite, quite easy to understand. Personal income tax runs from March to Feb, and you pay in August and February, which is why we're having the conversation now. The payment will be at the end of, of August. Companies, you pay six months from your year end. So if your year end is, is, is Feb, which many of them are, again, it's still August and February. Any other year in, so March, it will be September and March. April will be October and April, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's how you know when you must pay. And you must pay, and, and it's not on the slide, but it's critical information. You must pay before the last day, before cutoff on the last day. If SARS don't get the money into their account before cutoff on the last day, it becomes an issue to, to explain to them that it was paid on time. So our position is you pay the day before the last day. And, and, and I'll explain to you a little bit later about how we submit your returns. And you'll see that we don't actually submit your returns until your payment reflects. So that way we, 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 te we keep the two pieces of information linked, but it's very important to submit the return on time, but it's more important to have the payment in their bank account on time. So we'll take you through, we'll take you through that as well and hopefully that helps. Interest in penalties is 
the big the big thing we're trying to avoid on provisional tax, and this is where SARS are, are, are really any 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 government tax organisation, but they're draconian. They make you estimate, the, irrespective of the level of uncertainty, and if you're wrong, they penalise you and they charge interest. That's the reality. So we're we're saying we have to do everything possible to limit penalties and interest. And as a firm, we have very few penalties and interest with SARS for this exact reason, because the amount of focus we put onto every single person's tax return, and we'll take you through that just now, and a provisional tax return in terms of the calculation, the understanding, but more importantly, applying the rules. So what we do at Burns Acres is we apply 90% to taxable income that is over a million, and SARS allows you 80%, so we have a 10% buffer there. And for taxable income under a million, we apply 95% to our estimates and SARS allow 90%. But the thing about Prov 1, which is critical information, is that Prov 1, there's no penalties and no interest if you pay the base amount. And that's really important because if you estimate incorrectly, that's one thing. But if you pay the base amount, you almost get a free pass. So your, your, your forecasted income for the year could be 1,000 but your base amount is 100. You have the option of only paying the 100, which is fantastic from a cash and a timing perspective, but obviously at the end of the year, when you get to February, the 90 is gonna be due and payable. So you're not gonna be paying your provisional tax evenly, but that's acceptable as long as you understand uh, the approach. But the principle is the basic amount, if paid or paid above, won't result in penalties or interest on Prov 1. And that's, that, that forms the cornerstone of our strategic positioning, that one critical rule. So I want you to bear that in mind as we, as we continue through the, through the process of understanding. So this is what it's like to live in the world of tax. And now you all understand it because most of you have lived in the world of TERS. And um, we're starting to see on TV and radio how complicated things are. And that's really the bottom line. Every time they release information on concessions or on uh, tours or anything really, it, it's never, it never feels like it's smooth. It always feels like it's going to be a mission to understand. And this prov provisional one concession is exactly the same thing. Because first of all, the actual concession, which we'll get into now, is relatively easy to understand. But the questions like, how will the practicality unfold on the documentation? How will they manage the exceptions on the system? This is where our anxiety sits as, as, as tax staff. And we don't have the answers because they don't give them to us. So we all just have to be a little bit patient and, and try and deal with um, the legislation as we apply it to your individual situation and then how SARS respond. So we, we'll have to see how that goes. So the government's draft disaster act gave us some tax reliefs and we're gonna to focus today on um, who it applies to, which in a Burns Acre context, I mean, we don't deal with the big corporates on purpose. So almost all of our clients will apply, which is fine. And, and that's really the, the goal for us. But if there are some of the bigger guys who have concerns, then we just need to apply this particular um, framework to, um, to the situation and, and, and see where that takes us to your individual situation. So make sure you're a micro business and that you and that you and that you're tax compliant. All right, let's go to the next one. The thing about getting concessions from the government, they're quite clever actually, which we all we, we all sort of know that. Um, but the reality is that the government aren't going to give you a concession if you're not properly registered, up to date, and you haven't paid all your debts. So here's a classic example of someone who didn't want to do their provisional tax returns for their dormant company, but now has some sort of income, but they've got 10 years worth of dormant returns. And this year they rented it out or they had a sale, but they want to use the concession, but now they haven't sorted that out. So they're going to create an administrative headache for themselves for no reason. And this is all very basic stuff. So as a firm, one of our attempts or principles is that we don't want any clients to not have an, a, a position with SARS that's basically not ideal, meaning everyone has to submit everything. That's why we chase you. That's why we, we put pressure on saying, well, your 2017 needs to get sorted out. Don't drop balls. In the tax world, dropping balls equals major problems. If you keep yourself simple and sharp, you, you enable yourself to be effective as you move through the SARS channels of, of 
all the different types of processing. And this is where the concession sits. So we, we, what, what the bottom line is, they're allowing us to pay 15% of our provisional tax, whereas we normally would have paid 50%. So it's a 35% concession. And, and that's not, uh, you know, that's not bad news. But the real issue is number one, you're not getting anything, you're just getting a deferral. So there's no value add um, other than cash flow and timing. And number two is from a cash flow perspective, you might be deferring now, but come February, you're gonna have to pay the difference. So typically of how COVID relief has gone in South Africa, the bulk of it has been based on, on a deferral or debt principle, which really has to be repaid at some time or at some point. And most of you who were on the first sessions with us, you know, you understand our position on that, which we'll, which we'll take you through. So next year, when we get to February, we're gonna pay that balance. Now, the important thing from a concession perspective is that SARS are not going to penalize us. So there's no admin penalties. There's no interest on the, the short payments. So it's essentially a free relief, if you like. Um, and again, it's all about compliance. However, if someone in the rare case, which in Burns Acre won't happen, but if someone in the rare, rare case didn't qualify for COVID and claimed it, well, then they're going to reverse it and they're going to raise penalties and interest. So we do want to be careful there. Tables, you can see the difference. So normally you would pay first provisional at 50. Now they're saying you can pay it at 15. And I don't want you to think that we're defaulting to 15. We're going to take you through the strategy just now. So just be, be aware that that's where the differential sits. But on your second provisional, you would normally pay 50. You're now going to pay... Uh, the 50 again, but your third provisional, which they're giving you one month for, so essentially March, is when you're going to pay the 35. Um, so that's just a nice visual way of understanding how this plays out to your advantage as taxpayers. So internally at Burns Acre, what do we do? How do we look after your taxes? So all your, all your primary data is, started in, is, is stored in Microsoft Access, and we, have, we build Excel workbooks, which I'll take you through. We then generate the reports from Gradesoft, which is the letter that you get from us. That's the system. Gradesoft is an accounting system that links to e-filing, so the two talk to one another. And this is how we can prevent errors, but also make sure that the right information is linked to the right person um, and make sure that there's no, there's no errors. We're all about error prevention. So then we can analyze the workings against the data and reason a strategy, and I'm getting into the strategy now. Of course, being a professional services firm, we have many layers of review. So the work will start off with a clerk who will print the documents and do the checks. A manager will then make sure that it's aligned. And every single document in Burns Acre gets signed by myself. That means even if you are the smallest taxpayer in the world or the biggest, it means if you're an individual or you're a company or you're a trust, there's not one tax letter uh, other than some sort of exception that gets through our business without me signing it. Meaning I check everyone's reasoning and I'll show you the, the methodology that I use to check your reasoning. Everyone has a strategy, and I alluded to this in the newsletter the other day, but it's really important that our clients start getting to grips with this fundamental differentiator of our firm, and that is that no one's tax gets processed. Everyone's tax gets strategically developed, and it takes, depending whether you're with us for three months as a new client or, or, or years, but within three to six months, you should be into our system, and within two years, your strategy should be optimal, and everyone has a strategy. So the only reason it wouldn't be optimal is if you hadn't given information to us or we hadn't understood the information that you've given. But the point I'm trying to make is that every single return gets reviewed. That doesn't mean there aren't mistakes and that doesn't mean there aren't opportunities, but it means there's at least three layers of intelligence being applied to every single provisional tax return. So we don't want a situation where we make mistakes and we can't avoid them. But what we really want is by the time you look at it, for us to understand what your options are. And when I take you through the strategy, I'll show you how you put yourself into the different components and then you decide what's, what, what, what suits you. Once we are comfortable, you then get your first draft. And your first draft is really what we work on with you until we're happy. So this table just shows you a little bit about each element of your tax return. So obviously every client is a tax number to us, but a client group is, is someone who has a company. So for example, if you are a taxpayer in your own right and you have a company, to us, you're two clients, but you're only one person. So that's what we call a client group. 
The entity type is important because different taxes apply to different entities at different rates. So we need to make sure, and specifically in companies and small business tax rates, that, that, that's a big part of, of what I like to check. And you'll see we've got a section to check that. So those two things are linked. We obviously print and review. We make sure that your year ends are right. Because what you find uh, is that individuals over time, that, that we have had examples where people have defaulted to a February year end, but actually their statutory documents had them as a May and no one ever thought about it. So, you know, those are the types of things we're just continually checking. Um, I spoke about small business corp and tax. We look at your last year assessed, as I spoke about earlier, that's where the 8% differential or the base amount comes into play. And then of course, if you've got an assessed loss, that's very important. Because if you've got a million rand taxable income, but you've got a 500,000 rand assessed loss, your taxable income for the particular year is only 500,000. So we work through those different types of taxable incomes. There's a lot of people carried losses definitely in their companies. And certainly now with COVID, we're gonna see a lot more tax losses being created in legal, in legal entities. For those of you, the monthly clients, which is the bulk of our business, where we do the monthly accounts, this is where the power of having information that's live makes a big difference in terms of accuracy. Because your monthly accounts are accurate, your tax return is accurate, and your forecasting is accurate. But for clients who don't keep accounts and who use estimates, that's what causes us the most stress because we don't know exactly what your position is and, that, and then we're still putting something down. And if we're wrong, you're going to get penalized, which is why we encourage clients of all sizes, but anyone above nominal transactions. And by nominal transactions, I mean, if your entity has two or three transactions a month, that's fine. But once you're going sort of 10 or 15 transactions a month upwards, you need to have a system. It, it, it facilitates your tax planning, your SARS compliance, and they're relatively inexpensive. So that's why we encourage, encourage those systems. And then as I spoke about earlier, once you pay your money to SARS, we wait for the money to clear, we check that it's allocated to your tax code, and then we submit the return and match. And then of course we complete the process when we know that as an individual, your tax return is done. So never feel like your individual tax return, and that's the point of that slide, is something that happens quickly. Everything goes through a thorough process, Everything is checked, but we need you as part of the process. You're the key element because no one knows your business like you do. So now we get into our categories and starting to define our strategies. And for those of you who remember, we, we, we're sticking with these four uh, impacts on your taxable income because just for consistency's sake, but they're also totally relevant. So if you've had little to no impact, so if your turnover is up or only slightly down, business as usual, stable and predictable cash flow, then we're saying pay the base amount. If you really want to, and some clients prefer to pay the 50%, then pay the 50%, and by the 50%, I mean increase the base amount. But essentially, just remember, you're, all, you're giving SARS money for nothing, you're not protecting yourself, but if you feel like you're making your life easier by paying the additional amount, we don't have a problem with that. Um, so that one's really easy, and for those of you who fall into that category, I suggest doing exactly as predicted. The second category is a little, a little a little more complicated, and this is where we need management accounts. Because if you've been impacted by between 15 and 40%, if you pay on the base amount, you're probably going to be overpaying. If you reduce the base amount, you run the risk of um, the penalties, the interest, the inquiries, all of that. But based on how impacted you are and your cash flow, it might be beneficial to risk the change rather than pay the 50%. So in this category, here we've got to do some work. We, we, can't, we can't say left or right. You will be one of the two and you might have a sense, but we want to try and back that sense up with numbers. We want to look at your, 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 for, your current profitability, your forecast, your tax strategy for yourself, and we want to make the best possible decision. And let me digress just for one second while we talk about, while I mentioned tax, tax strategy. So I think what a lot of people tend to believe is that tax strategy is some sort of overarching magical ball that once you, once you have one, your tax is minimized. And it couldn't be further from the truth. And I alluded to this in my newsletter the other day from the firm. And we spoke about the aggregate sum of small gains or the number of, of tax opportunities that exist. And so the reason why we're focusing on provisional tax today, because it's current and it's relevant, but it's one thing. When you have a tax strategy, you probably need five, 10, 15, maybe 20 elements, depending on how big and, and complex your wealth is to maximize tax strategy. And the point I'm trying to make is this, if you save a thousand rand a month, that's a lot of money and it's useful. 
But if you save a thousand rand a month, 10 times over, now you're starting to be tax effective. And that's what I really want to be pushing as I communicate with, with everyone going forward is that tax strategy is not about big wins. It's about getting all the small wins. There aren't that many big, big wins available, but the small wins are, there's a lot of them. And that's how you develop an effective financial structure is on those small wins and as many of them as possible. So in the mild impact space, to bring it all back to where we are in terms of the strategy, we need to look at whether those wins of the 15%, for example, or less is worth it relative to the other side of the equation. And we really just have to be very specific about how impacted your business is. Now, the guys in the heavily impacted space, completely different. Here, once again, it would be ideal to have management accounts. But if your turnovers drop between 40 and 80% and you've got real earnings problems, we're saying the probability that you're going to have tax or profit is so low, we're almost definitely going to want to reduce your, um, your base amount. And we're almost certainly going to lean towards nil returns or nominal taxes. So here, the risk of penalties, et cetera, is very high. Depend, especially, especially if you're someone who can reignite their tray or if you're someone who can do really big deals and you can bring significant profitability in, now you've got to run the risk of paying the penalty. And my personal view would be make decisions based on what you know now. So rather pay what you can afford to pay and is due now, even if that's zero. And if you are lucky enough to catch a big deal or to get profitability reignited, then run the risk of, of the penalty and the interest. Because the alternative is that you're going to overpay SARS, you're going to cripple them, you cripple yourself, you're going to not get penalties and interest, but you're also not going to have your money. You're going to be fighting SARS for months to get it back on assessment, and you're just going to create a headache for yourself. And your fundamental responsibility is your business, not SARS. So your cash should be used to protect your business, not SARS. And that's really our position in that heavily impacted space. The guys that are in the destructive space, the guys like, you know, whether you're in the hotel or whether you're in the restaurant industry or any of the, the many people that are affected, hairdressers, the, the, the like, I mean, you, you, your, your business has fundamentally been destroyed from a tax position. And so we're saying, unless there's something we're missing, you know, you're going to be a nil return. It's, it's the only logical way to deal with the fact that there's no tax. And remember, a lot of people feel like talking to SARS or paying SARS is because you owe them something. You never owe SARS anything other than their percentage of your profit. Meaning, if you don't have profit, you have no liability to SARS. And that's important, especially when we do tax planning, because if we can utilize your expenditure and make it allowable against your taxable income, we can reduce or negate tax payable. And that's where real sort of momentum comes in wealth building, by using tax money in your own life instead of giving it to the government and being more effective. So for any of you who think that this is complicated, this is for you. Um, the reality is even simple tax takes a lot of understanding, but I want to try and distill it today so that you walk away with a level of confidence and you feel like you know exactly you know, what's going on. So I think that's really the, the, the broad strokes. I haven't been following the questions, but I, I think I'm going to hand over to Al, and then maybe we can, we can open up the mics and, and, and you guys can ask a couple of questions or if there's something I didn't explain properly, let's focus on that and try and clarify. But I do hope that, you know, the, the, the 20 minutes that we, we chatted about all of this stuff, you've got an understanding of you know, the basics, why this works, how it pertains to you, and how to go about without compromising yourself. So thank you for listening. Thanks, Brad. I think a um, couple of questions, um, I haven't seen, seen many pop up, but certainly one of the things that I know is quite relevant is we've, we've touched on, the, on the, the relief that's available, and we've also spoken about the four categories of businesses, um, no to low impact, medium, heavily impacted and destructive. Um, what, is, what, would be the, what would be the view on accepting the, the tax relief that's, that's been made available in terms of payment of provisional taxes um, in relation to the categories that you find yourself in. So I think that's, that's one of the questions that the guys want to understand is say, if my business falls into the mildly impacted category or the heavily impacted, should I accept it or don't I accept the relief made available? Um, so if you could just clarify that. 
so I mean, my, my, the, fir the firm's view is, is, is to not take the relief unless it's physically necessary. So it's not about what category you're in, it's about your cash flow position. And to my earlier point, if you're in the, the, the more, the damaged categories, you're unlikely to have, you're unlikely to owe them any money. So you don't need the relief because we're probably going to go with null returns. That's, that's the reality. So it really only applies to the people who are partially affected. And the people who are partially affected, I'm saying, well, if you're partially affected, just pay the base amount if you can afford it from a cash perspective because you protect yourself. If you simply don't have the cash, well, then we have no option but to go with the 15% and, and, and to, and to uh, uh, utilize it. Um, but if you prefer to, to, to retain your cash, so even if you have cash, but you don't want to give it to SARS for obvious reasons, then just pay the 15%. But it really only works in the space of the people who have a limited impact. I think everyone else is going to reduce their basic amounts. It, it makes no sense to give SARS money that they don't deserve. So I hope that helps. And what about, what about companies where we've got a, a base amount um, and obviously the, you know, the clients are, have, have battled, they've been heavily impacted by COVID or their, their businesses have changed significantly and the base amounts are now significantly higher than, and which results in a bigger payable versus what they, they feel they should be paying. I know you touched on it earlier, but um, the, what, is the, what is the firm view on that? Should, should they go with the base, the base amounts or should they go with the, the lower amount which we would then estimate? So we would want you to go with the lower amount and this is where the management accounts are so important because we just want to have confidence that the lower amount is, is realistic and that your forecasting ability is accurate. So that's definitely a space to drop but it must be credibly dropped because remember, SARS are probably, and we're seeing it already, but SARS are going to come and say, why did you drop your base amount? You can't just say things like, oh, because of COVID. We've got to give them supporting information. My revenue dropped, my, my costs look like this, my forecast looks like that. And then they can't, they can't say, well, this is a problem because you've got to have the supporting info. So my biggest worry, and I said it earlier, is the clients who don't have accounting systems, the clients who don't have monthly accounts or at least every second month proper accounts and who fall into the space because now we're guessing. And if there's one thing we don't do at Burns Acre, it's guess. You know, that's something we like to do when we're playing games on the weekend but at work, we don't have time to guess. So it, it, we don't, I'm very uncomfortable being in that space where someone doesn't know, because if you don't know, we don't know. Um, so again, this would be an opportunity to encourage people to say, well, this is your situation. We don't really want to guess. Let's go and capture the six months and let's put a basic system in place to protect you. So it's all about your information. It's applying what you know. So the point of today isn't to tell you the answer. The point of today is to give you so much direction that you take your individual circumstances and you plug them in and you say to yourself, does that make sense? And if it makes sense, well, then you, you're good to go. If it doesn't make sense, then you need to come and talk to us so we can figure out what the disconnect is, what's causing the conflict between what you think and what you see, and then we do the work. Okay, great. Um, I think that that covers most of it. Um, are you comfortable? Let's let's open the floor to any to any live questions. We have a bit of uh, bit of live Q and A, and not just through the uh, through the Zoom chat. Um, I think if um, if we can maybe we'll maybe unmute everybody and um, just ask a question at a time. If anybody's got a question, if they can just raise their hand, and if uh, you can just uh, pick uh, pick a question, Brad, if we can do that. Yeah, go for it. Let's try. Okay, fantastic. I like to think that there's no questions because I did such a good job of explaining it. Everyone's sitting on their phones and finalizing their, 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 their prog text and they're, they're happy to go. So let's see. there's no questions that's fine I mean that's good news so no one want to put up their hand eh? we're all happy I see lots of financial managers there like Nicholas Brown and the guys so I hope that you, you you've got all your info but you're normally good at your prom so that's amazing cool well then if that's it guys I'm happy I think we can wrap it up and if there's no one got any questions then we did a good job of explaining it. and of course guys we're always here to help so if you need to know anything just give us a shot
um, and we'll, we'll help you. Just in terms of where we are in the process, so almost everyone should have their letters. There's a few letters to go out in the next couple of days and then that'll be that. So if you haven't got your letter yet, maybe reach out in, in a day or two just in case we haven't missed something. But if you have, then you should be in the process of finalizing what you want to pay and, and, and if you have questions around that, you know, let us know. And then Brad, if I can just um, add to that, certainly if, if you're a Burns Acre client and you haven't heard from us yet, um, or you, you want a bit more clarity, please feel free to reach out either directly to, to Brad or myself, or if you've got a relationship manager or a manager at Burns Acre that you're dealing with, um, please just reach out to them and uh, just see what's happening in the process, get a bit more comfort. But the, the point is, is that we're here to support you through the process. Um, it's, it's, it's not a complicated process, but there's a lot of work that goes into it and a lot that's involved, and we have to get it right. So um, as, much as, as much as you would rely on us to, to guide you through the process, we're also heavily re reliant on you, because as Brad said, nobody knows your business better than you. So please communicate with us. We, we need that communication um, in order to, in order to pro forward and we'll just drive the process in the background. Great. Any, any last opportunity for any questions before we, before we wrap up? Right, so I think what, what we'll do is we'll, we'll take some of the questions that have come through in the chat, we'll add them to the Q&A section of the presentation, and we will send out the presentation to everybody that, that was on the Prezo mailing list. And uh, once again, just thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. We know everybody's busy, busy lives, busy schedules. Um, but thank you very much for allowing this opportunity to just touch base with you. And Brad, thank you very much for the insights. I think it's been, it's been really insightful, really informative. Um, and I think it's painted a good picture on the prov tax scene and, and what, what actually goes into um, the provisional tax process and why it's so important. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone, have a good day. Great, thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.